Yeah. All right. We're going to we're going to sing um, hymn number one hundred and seventy five in your blue Trinity hymnals. So let's stand and sing together. chapter 8. If you don't know where Nehemiah is, if you open up your Bibles right to the middle, that's the book of Psalms. Flip to the left, right before Psalms comes the book of Job, right before Job comes the book of Esther, and right before Esther comes the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah chapter 8 and verses 1 to 12. And all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the, high, uh, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it before the square which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Messiah on his right hand, and Padiah, Mishael, Melchijah, Hashem, Hashbadana, Zechariah, and Meshalam on his left hand. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen, Amen, while lifting their hands. And they bowed low and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Pelaiah, the Levites, explained the law to the people. 
While the people remained in their place, they read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. Then, Nehemiah, who was governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go eat of the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the Lord, joy of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went away to eat and to drink and to send portions and to celebrate a great festival, because they understood the words which had been made known to them. This is the word of the Lord. You may be seated. Well, happy Reformation Sunday. Today, we celebrate the 505th anniversary of what most consider the start of the Protestant Reformation. It was that long ago, actually 504 years and 364 days ago, that a German monk named Martin Luther nailed his 95 discussion points or theses or complaints as they were to the castle church door in Wittenberg, Germany. Luther was not trying to start the Protestant Reformation when he did that. As a matter of fact, he wrote his 95 complaints in Latin so that they could have a scholarly discussion about it at the level of the, the theologians could discuss, discuss these things. But Luther's students, who could read Latin, saw all of the complaints that Luther had written and thought they were so brilliant and so on point that they quickly translated Luther's complaints into the common parlance in German and then sent them to the four corners of the German Empire. And the spark of the Protestant Reformation was fanned into flames. Many things changed in Christ's church in the decades and centuries following 1517. So that we can truthfully say that we are here now in this church, in this place, because we are the beneficiaries of the blessings of the Protestant Reformation so long ago. It is... Truly important to know history, especially church history, because it displays for us the fact that God is still working in the world. And one of the things that the Reformation accomplished was so fundamental to life in Christ. And it's always the first thing that Satan attacks. That is the preaching of the gospel. The recovery of preaching. Preaching as the main mode of communicating the Word of God to the people, had been recovered in the 16th century as the primary means of fulfilling the great commission of our Lord to go into all nations and make disciples, teaching them to obey all that He has commanded. In my estimation, the, the greatest result of the Reformation was this, that preaching and, and that the Word of God was brought back into the church again. The church which had for centuries been bogged down in the mire of superstition and sacramentalism finally returned to the Bible and to the exposition of the Bible. Listen to the words of Martin Luther. This great and marvelous thing, he's talking about regeneration. That's when, when the Lord takes out the heart of stone and gives a heart of flesh, when he saves a person. He says, this great and marvelous thing is accomplished entirely through the office of preaching the gospel. Viewed superficially, this looks like a trifling thing without any power. Like any, ordinary's man, any ordinary man's speech and word. In other words, someone could come up to a lectern and 
talk about sports or politics or the weather or whatever, and those words would just fall right to the ground. But Luther says something different happens. Something supernatural is going on when the word is being preached. This is what he says. When such preaching is heard, God's invisible divine power is at work in the hearts of men through the Holy Spirit. Therefore, St. Paul calls the gospel the power of God unto salvation for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. It is the preaching which is the means by which God takes a sinner out, plucked out of the mass of perishing ones and into his kingdom. John Calvin wrote, Among so many excellent gifts which God has adorned mankind, it is a peculiar privilege that he deems to consecrate men's lips and tongues to his service, that his voice may be heard in them. In another place in his Institutes, Calvin writes this, Here is the supreme power with which pastors of the church, by whatever name they're called, should be invested. Namely, to dare all boldly for the word of God, compelling all the virtue, glory, wisdom, and rank of the world to yield and obey its majesty. You understand what he's saying there? That the preacher's job is to proclaim the word in such a way as to compel all of those even kings to submit themselves underneath this word of God. The Word of God has preeminence in our lives. One of the things that the Protestant Reformation changed was this idea that had been rampant within the Roman Church for so long, which is that there is a magisterium or the church, the church teachings, sit in judgment on the Word, that the church is over the Word. And Luther said that's exactly opposite of how it should be. The church needs to be under the word that this is what has authority. This is what must be proclaimed. Not the words of mere men, but this Bible which is breathed by God. That's what was recovered for us. And Calvin says that the preaching of the gospel must compel all the rank of the world to obey its majesty, to command all the form, or to command all from the highest to the lowest, trusting to its power. To do what? To build up the house of Christ and overthrow the house of Satan. To feed the sheep and chase away the wolves. To instruct and exhort the docile to accuse, rebuke, and subdue the rebellious and petulant. That's what the preaching of the word does. It does all of those things at the same time. Because it's alive. This book is a living book. It's the only book in the whole world which is alive. And it applies to all people in all places at all times. It always applies to us. It applies to the heathen that is living in the jungle. It applies to the person in the governor's mansion. It applies to all people. It applies to people in China and people in America. Everywhere. You know how it, how it does that? How is it able to do that? It's been applied to all of us throughout history. Oh, so much has changed throughout history. The Bible always speaks to wherever people are. It's, I think that's part of what it means. When the scripture says about it itself that it is alive. This is the living book. It's alive. It always, always has universal truth for mankind. Thank God for the recovery of the scriptures. We take it for granted, I think, that we have the Bible in our homes, in our hands. Especially here in this country and and we shouldn't take it for granted this is the greatest physical treasure that we have on earth 
this is, the greatest physical treasure. The reformers were not the first to deal with a famine in the land of the word of God. There were numerous times in Israel's history where she turned away from God's word, delivered through the prophets, and rejected it, and rejected them. In such cases, God pleaded with his people to turn back. Turn back before it's too late. But when they would not, he sent judgment upon them until they humbled themselves and submitted themselves under the word once again. And one such example is found in the text that I would like to look at today, which is Nehemiah chapter 8, verses 1 to 12. I pray that the Lord will use this brief time together to cause revival in our own hearts through the preaching of the word. Look at verses 1 to 3 in Nehemiah 8. <clears throat> and all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men and women and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Let me just pause there for one second. I noticed something here as I was preparing this message. He brought the law before the men and the women. There's only two genders, by the way. Okay? Men and women. He brought the law before the men and the women and all who could understand. What does that mean, all who could understand? Obviously, he's talking about children. Children. I believe that uh, children need to be in the worship service when the word is being preached. Ezra preached the word and spoke the word to all who could understand. I'm not talking about nurseries. I'm talking about this, this modern invention of taking children away from the preaching of the word to have something else while the preaching of the word is going on. Those who really could understand if they just sat under it. Anyway, that's just a, a side note here. Let's, let's go on. He read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women and those who could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. I want to give some history very briefly here. There were two major kingdoms after Solomon's time. Uh, David had united the whole country, and Solomon lived under a united uh, Israel. And then Solomon's children divided from ten tribes in the northern area and two tribes in the south. And there was basically two countries, one called Israel and one called Judah. And Israel had quickly fallen into rampant idolatry and God sent the Assyrians to judge them. Judah was not far behind on the tales of Israel's sin. And when Judah sinned and unrepentantly continued to worship idols, God, as an instrument of his judgment, sent Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians to come in and destroy Jerusalem. And raised the temple to the ground. And took the people captive and brought them into Babylon. And there they were for 70 years. Until the time of King Cyrus. Where he made a decree that Zerubbabel could go back and start to rebuild. And the first of the exiles came back with Zerubbabel. And then a second wave came back with Ezra. And a third wave came back with Nehemiah. And during this time, in the context of the book of Nehemiah, they had just rebuilt the wall surrounding Jerusalem. Now, the reason that they had a wall is because in ancient times, if you didn't have a giant wall, then marauding bands of Soldiers could come in and just burn your city to the ground. They needed protection. They needed a wall. So they're building the wall with a sword in one hand and they're putting the bricks into the wall. And it's completed. Once that was finished, the people were like, we want to hear from God. 
they asked, the text says that they asked Ezra, give us the word. Preach the word to us. These people had never heard it before. These were the former exiles brought out of Babylon. So many of them had never seen a Torah scroll. They had never read the words of the law. So many of them were totally ignorant. But they knew that there is a God in Israel. And they asked Ezra, teach us, bring the word to us. It says, all the people gathered as one man, in verse 1. There was no one in all the returned exiles who was excluded from the gathering. They're all there for one reason. They want Ezra the priest to bring out the law of Moses. Look at the hunger that these people had for the living bread of the word. They asked him for it. Give that to us. That's what we want. They asked that because their greatest desire at that time was to hear from God. They put aside all other familial duties, all entertainment, all work, all thoughts of anything but the Lord. Let us hear from God. That's their cry. This is evidence that the Spirit is at work, or the Spirit was at work in the souls of the people of Judah. Indeed, to hear from God's Word is exactly what the repentant person always Wants. It is those who refuse to repent who hide from the light of the word. And these former exiles to Babylon desired to leave Babylon in the rearview mirror, to return to God out of Babylon and into Canaan. Is that why you're here today? <clears throat> is your greatest desire to hear from God? He's given us this collection of 66 books, which are the answer to the deepest problems of our life. Thomas Guthrie wrote this, The Bible is an armory of heavenly weapons, a laboratory of infallible medicines, a mine of exhaustless wealth. It is a guidebook for every road, a chart for every sea, a medicine for every malady, and a balm for every wound. Rob us of our Bible! And you take away the sun from the sky. That's it. And so Ezra heard the people. He heard their request. And he brings out the scroll of the law. And he read from it. Look at what it says in verse 3. He read from it before the square. Which was in front of the water gate. From early morning until midday. All right. To me, this gives me license now to continue to preach as long as I want. Look at early morning until midday. <coughs> what is he reading? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was without form and void. Darkness was over the surface, surface of the deep and the spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, right, he's reading that. He's starting at Genesis 1-1. And the people are standing there early in the morning. Look at what else it says in verse 3. From early morning until midday in the presence of men and women, those who can understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. They were all attentive to it. They were listening. They were looking at him. Listening, hanging on every word because they knew what it was. They knew that it's God's word. Hours of just reading Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. And the people were attentive that whole time. It wasn't like someone said, you know what, I'm going to leave at the Exodus and come back once he finishes Numbers. Okay. And it'll be a little more engaging by the time he gets to do it around him. No, no, no. <clears throat> you know, it's only this generation that has such a short attention span and inability to... Yeah, I mean, I'm preaching to myself. I'm speaking to myself when I say this. Inability to pay attention for longer than 15 minutes... That 
like the, the, this generation looks at the Bible and says, oh, what is this boring? Have you ever heard, have you ever heard Christians say things like this? You ever read the book of Leviticus? Like, yawn. Like, really? The only way that someone could say it is if they didn't really know what they were reading, what they were looking at. That's the only way. Here these people from early morning until midday were all attentive to the book of the law. What a rebuke it is to how lazy we have become. Look at verses 4 to 8. <clears throat> Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium that they had made for the purpose. And beside him stood all these names I won't say again. Verse 5. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. You know, I'm going to read that again. Let's stand as I read verse 5. Let's stand together. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people. For he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen! Amen! amen. You may be seated. And they lifted up their hands, and they bowed low, and they worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. I want to say something else here. They worship the Lord with their faces to the ground. I've mentioned this, I think, before, but because it says this, it's important to note. Every time in the Bible when someone is worshiping the Lord, it is always face forward with their face to the ground. When they're falling down in worship, they're falling on their face before the Lord. We see this all over the scripture. When Jesus is transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, the disciples hear the voice coming from the cloud. They fall on their faces in worship. These people, they say, Amen! They fall on their faces. In the book of Revelation, the elders fall on their faces. They cast their crowns before the Lord. They're on their faces. Conversely, any time in the Bible, when someone falls backwards, it is a sign of judgment. Judgment. The judgment of God. Can you prove this? Yes. Eli, when the ark was stolen by the Philistines, Eli falls backwards. His neck is broken. You see, uh, 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 when in Isaiah 28... That the Lord will say to this people, here is rest, find rest for the weary. But you did not lis listen, therefore you will stumble and fall backwards and be broken and snared and taken captive. It's Isaiah 28, 11 to 13. Or you look at when the soldiers were coming to arrest Jesus and Jesus said, who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. And he says, I am he. What do they do? They fall backwards and fall over one another. If you fall backwards in the Bible, it's judgment. When you fall forwards in the Bible, it's worship. I just have to say, as a rabbit trail side note, it has nothing to do with this, but it's important for us. If you turn on so-called phony Christian television today, and you see these guys like Benny Hinn and all the others who are, what are they doing? Knocking people over. How are they falling? They're all falling backwards. Bible says that that's, that's, a, that's a biblical imagery is a sign of judgment on them. It's because what they're doing is false and fake. It's not real. It's false. It's important to know that, actually. Every time. You look, at, you look at Benny Hinn, he'll take his jacket off and start swinging it around. And what do the people do in all the rows? They're all falling backwards. Wow. Someone should tell them this from the Bible. That's actually a bad sign if that's happening. Okay. So the people fall on their faces to the ground. And then 
uh, Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akab, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Messiah, Kalita, Azariah, Josabad, Hanan, Peliah, the Levites, explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. And they read from the book, from the law of God, translating to give the sense that they understood the meaning. There's so much here to talk about. <clears throat> First, uh, this is the true definition of preaching that we see here. Ezra is standing at a wooden podium. Why does the Bible give us that deal, uh, detail? That, that the podium was made out of wood. The Hebrew translated wooden podium is etzmigdala. Etzmigdala literally means a pulpit or tower made out of a tree. So he's standing at a pulpit made out of a tree. I believe that there's significance here, which is tied to verse 8, but we're going to come back to this. Suffice it to say, the pulpit was not metal or stone or plastic or glass, but Ezra and, and his companions were preaching from a tree about a tree. Second, the elders of the people were standing with Ezra. All those names. They're giving their support to the preaching of the word. These men did not want it to seem to the people that Ezra was alone in his preaching of the word. The elders stood by him. They gave their assent to what was being said. They supported him because they knew that what Ezra was doing was vital to the life of their people. Third, we see that the people stood for the reading of the word. It's a show of respect and reverence for the Bible. And when the word was opened, the people all rose to their feet. I mean, that, that's why we stand when we read the scripture. This is the reason why. It's a sign of reverence for God's holy word. And then we see something remarkable. When Ezra praises the Lord... The great God, all the people shout, Amen, Amen, while lifting their hands. And they bowed down and worship with their faces to the ground. See, this, this being described here, this is a real worship service. It's a real worship service. They did not need a laser light show. They did not need a smoke machine. They did not need a super loud rock band. Their worship was based around the proclamation of the word. The word was enough. It was sufficient. Just the reading of the word by itself was sufficient to cause the people to worship. Worship God. It's beautiful. There's a pattern here, I think, for us. In the scripture, right here in, in the scripture. This is how preaching should be. This is how the worship of the church should be. Fourth, we see from the text in verses 7 to 8 that the word was not only read, but also explained. Ezra and his friends explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. And they read from the book, from the law of God. Now it says translating to give the sense, so they understood the reading. The Hebrew word for translating is the word parasha. It means to be made clear, to exegete. Ezra and the other elders of the people were preaching, in other words. They were making the Bible clear to the people. This Bible, which showed them both the heinous nature of their sin and rebellion against God and his promise of the Redeemer who would come and shed his blood like all of the sacrifices of the book of Leviticus and elsewhere pointed forward to. I believe that this is the significance of Ezra preaching from a pulpit made from a tree because all true exposition of the Bible points to a tree and points to the man who died upon it. All true exposition of the Bible does that. Because it's all pointing toward Jesus. What is preaching? Preaching is something different than merely teaching or giving a lecture. Teaching gives knowledge. There, is, there are facts. 
There are things you need to learn. That is teaching. And what the teacher does is he tells you what those facts are. But preaching is different from teaching in this way. That the preacher does not just give the facts. This is what they are. But also exhorts and pleads and begs the people to come, come. Not just here are the facts, but you, you must believe in these things. You must put your faith in Christ. Martin Lloyd-Jones said this, what is preaching? Preaching is logic on fire. It is logic coming through a man who is on fire for God. It is theology, which is, which is empowered by the Holy Spirit, delivered through the preacher. And the preacher speaks the word. And as the, the, the notes, the sound coming out of the preacher's mouth travels literally through the air, and it goes into a gate on the side of your head. There's a gate. There's two gates on the sides of your head. And those words enter into the ear gate. And they travel from the ear gate up to the brain and down to the heart. That's what happens in preaching. It's something supernatural which is going on. And the Holy Spirit always uses it. He does say, really, he always uses it? He always uses it. That's what Isaiah says, that the word will not return void, but always accomplish the purpose for which he sends it. Yeah, but, but I know people who have sat under solid, good Bible preaching for a long time, and they remain unchanged. As a matter of fact, they're even harder now than they were before. That's right. That also is a function of preaching. That the same sun in the sky that melts the wax hardens the clay. We cannot explain it. I do not know who is who or which is which. I do not know whose heart will be softened by the preaching of the word and who will hear the preaching of the word and be like, I don't want to like what that guy's saying. I don't like the fact that Jesus says he is the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except by him. I don't like the fact that Jesus calls me to repent. I don't like the fact that, you know, I have to give up my sin. I don't like that. The longer such a person goes in their unbelief and unrepentance, the harder the heart gets. Yet even still, even to such a person, the grace of Jesus is enough to break through so that someone could hear the message being preached over and over and over and over and be hard to it every time. And then suddenly, suddenly, like Paul on the road to Damascus, a light shines down from heaven. Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? It is I, Jesus, whom you are persecuting. More earth-shattering shattering words have never been spoken than the words that Jesus spoke to that man on that day. He was not a seeker, all right? Paul's not a seeker. He's not like, hey, I'm going to go to Damascus and check out the Willow Creek Damascus campus. Like, no, no, he wasn't doing that. He wanted to go to the Willow Creek Damascus campus and arrest everyone and throw them into prison and stone them to death, right? That's what he wanted to do. Such a man was seeking only the will of his master at that, at that time, who was not God. But you know what Paul says? You know what Paul says? I've been studying this in Sunday school. I teach Sunday school before the service in the mornings, and we've been looking through Romans. We just started Romans. And Paul begins his letter to the Romans by saying this, Paul, a doulos of Jesus Christ. Doulos, a slave. Paul, a slave of Christ. 
He was at one time a slave of the evil one. Now he became a slave of Christ. He was purchased by Christ. The word of Christ came to him. Faith comes through hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Now in Paul's case, it was Christ directly saying to him, Stop it! <laughs> and he was changed. And he became an apostle. It's through hearing the word. What a marvelous description this text gives us of soul-stirring, life-changing, God-honoring preaching. It's what we need. This, this really is what we need. And we see the response of the people to it in the very next verses. Look at verses 9 uh, to 12. Then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest, and the scribe, and the Levites, taught the people and said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Okay, I just have to... Look, first notice this. The governor was there for this momentous occasion. The word... It's being read and proclaimed. The governor's there. How I wish that our own governor would attend the preaching of the word. How things would change if he did. We should pray for that. What was the reaction by the listeners to the hearing of the law preached? Verse 9 tells us, The people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. What caused this response? Well, verse 10 tells us, they were grieved. Look at what he said to them. Nehemiah said to them in verse 10, Go eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So the people were grieved. How are they grieved? The law shows us our sin. That's the reason why. Most of these people had never heard the truths about sin and the fall until this point, until this moment, when Ezra says to them, and then Eve went and took of the tree and she ate and she gave to her husband and he ate. Oh, that's the reason. That's the reason for this wretched, fallen, broken world. It's the reason for it. It's the reason that the Jewish people were put into captivity for 70 years because of sin. And when they heard this preaching and exposition of the law of Moses, they're cut to the heart. They said, what shall we do to be saved? Do you know in all true revival, when revivals happen, that's always the question that people asked. What shall we do to be saved? It's what happened in Acts when Peter says, You crucified the Lord of glory. The people cried out, What shall we do to be saved? When Jonathan Edwards went in 1741 and he preached sinners in the hands of an angry God on June 8th at his friend's church. And his text was Deuteronomy, Their foot shall slide in due time. And he's preaching. He's telling people about the God who is angry over sin and angry at sinners. And that he, his justice is just about to be poured out. The people cried out, what shall we do to be saved? They're mourning and crying and grieving over the state of their own soul, of their sin. And at that point, at that point, where the gospel comes in. That's where the gospel comes in. This is the good news. That Jesus Christ came to pay the price you cannot pay. That outside of Jesus Christ, you and I would be utterly lost. That Jesus is our one and only foundation, our only hope in this whole world. He is it. He is it. It's amazing now. You think, wow, you got all that from the text that they're talking about Jesus? I believe that they were, and I'm going to tell you why I think that they were. 
momentarily. So it says, I mean, think about all the things that they were hearing about. The fall, the curse, the necessity of blood. Uh, Leviticus, they're reading Leviticus, books of the Bible. They're reading Leviticus. Leviticus 17, 11, I've given you the blood to make atonement for yourselves on the altar. It is the blood that makes atonement for one's life. Oh, where does he give us the blood? He gives us the blood at the cross of Jesus. And look at what it says. And they were cut, or, 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 or all, sorry, it, it says that they, they're mourning and grieving. And Nehemiah tells them not to grieve anymore, for the joy of the Lord is their strength. Look at in, uh, in 2 Timothy 3.16, it says, All scripture is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Hearing scripture for the first time, the text says that they needed to be calmed down. They were all so sad. But did Ezra and the elders leave the people in their mournful state? No. Look at verses 11 and 12. The Levites calmed the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went away to eat and to drink and to send portions and to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. They understood them. Listen now, the Bible would not say that they understood them unless they understood them. Now, in order to understand well, why why are there sacrifices that have to be offered? Why did Moses say that a prophet like him is coming and that we should listen to him? Like, why? What do we see in all of these things over and over and over? The promise of a Messiah. The promise of a Redeemer. In Luke 24, Jesus walks with the disciples on the road to Emmaus. They don't recognize him and well, they're like, don't you know what's going on? He's the only one who knows what's going on. And, and then he, as he's walking, he's explaining to them, starting with Moses and the prophets, how the Son of Man had to be delivered into the hands of wicked men and die on the cross and rise from the dead. That that's what had to happen. And then they get into the house where they're staying in Emmaus, and they're about to have dinner with this stranger that's been telling them all about the word, all about the books of Moses, explaining the meaning to them so that they understood. He takes bread and he breaks it. And as soon as he breaks it, their eyes are opened. They see it's Jesus. And then, poof, David Copperfield. He's like gone, right? He disappears. I'm not saying Jesus is like David Copperfield. I'm just saying, like he disappears. Now think about this. What's the very next thing that they say when Jesus disappears? Do they say this? Our hearts were burning within us when he disappeared. Our hearts were burning within us when we recognized him. No. They say, were not our hearts burning within us as he explained to us the meaning of the law? As he explained to us what Moses and the prophets were talking about? They felt that they understood it finally. Finally, they understood. That's exactly what the text says about these people. They went away rejoicing because they understood what was being said to them. I mean, you look at the book of Leviticus, there's not a lot to rejoice in, in it by itself. But if you see that it's pointing forward to someone greater, to a greater sacrifice, then yes, you can read Leviticus and you can say, Hallelujah! Amen! Look at this. This shows the heinousness of sin. This bloody book is full of blood. Rivers and rivers of blood. It shows how bad sin is. How heinous it is. And the fact that a sacrifice is needed shows that Oh, I would mourn and mourn unless a sacrifice was actually provided for me. In their case, they realized the promise. Now, I have another reason for believing that. It says that they went away to drink and send portions to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. I'd like you to look back at Nehemiah um, chapter 7. The very end, the very last 
verse of Nehemiah 7. We're looking at Nehemiah 8, so it's one chapter before. And right at the end of the verse, And when the seventh month came, the sons of Israel were in their cities. Now look at chapter 8 and verse 2. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. Okay, so when is this? It's, like, we would say July 1st, but it's a different calendar. Okay, it's not really July 1st. So seventh month in the Hebrew calendar on the first day of the month. And there's this, like, talk in, Ezra, in Nehemiah 8 about a festival. What's it talking about? Let's go back now to Leviticus chapter 23. It's Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 23. Starting in verse 3. For six days work may be done, but on the seventh day there is a Sabbath of complete rest. A holy convocation, you shall not do any work. It is a Sabbath to the Lord in all your dwellings. Now, this chapter has to do with religious festivals, Leviticus 23. So the first one that he mentions is the Sabbath day. Every seventh day, there's a Sabbath. Okay, what's the next one? Then, verse 6, Then on the fifteenth day of the same month, there is a feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, verse 5, verse 5, really. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month, at twilight, is the Lord's Passover. Now, Passover, that's the second one. First is the Sabbath, then comes Passover in this sequence, right? Then, verse 6, on the 15th day of the same month, there is a feast of unleavened bread to the Lord. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. On the first day you shall have a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work. All right, and then, after you have uh, the Sabbath, and then you have Passover, and then you have the feast of unleavened bread. And then, verse 16, you shall count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you present a new grain offering to the Lord. What's 50 days? That's the Hebrew festival called Pentecost. Penta means 50, right? So you have the Sabbath, Passover, feast of unleavened bread, Pentecost. All right. We see these things ultimately fulfilled in Christ, don't we? And Christ says that he's the Lord of the Sabbath. He is crucified literally on Passover. That's what the, the last supper that Jesus had was a Passover meal. Is a Passover Seder was the last supper. <laughs> Feast of unleavened bread had to do with sin being dealt with. You see, after... Uh, 50 days after Christ, after the Passover, what happens? The Holy Spirit comes down at Pentecost, right? So we see like this sequence of events that are happening in Leviticus are being fulfilled in the New Testament account, in the Gospels and the book of Acts. But then we see some other things that are like, when was this fulfilled? All right. If you look, um, verse 22. When you reap the harvest of your land, moreover, you shall not reap to the very corners of your field, nor gather the gleaning of your harvest. You are to leave them for the needy and the alien. I am the Lord your God. Again, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, verse 24, Speak to the sons of Israel saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month. Wait, wait, when is our account taking place in Ezra chapter, I mean, uh, Nehemiah chapter 8? The seventh month, the first of the month. That's when Ezra reads from the book of the law. Look at what it says. In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder, by the blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. You shall not do any laborious work, but you shall present an offering by fire to the Lord. Look at the next verses. 
The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, On exactly the tenth day of the seventh month, it is the Day of Atonement. What's the Day of Atonement called? Yom Kippur, right? And then, verse 33, Again the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, On the fifteenth of this seventh month is the Feast of Booths, the Feast of Tabernacles, for seven days to the Lord. So, <clears throat> Here's what I would submit to you. Though there may be some who have a different eschatological position than I do sitting in this room right now. I don't know who they are, but there might be. What I would submit to you is this. That those first four festivals were already fulfilled in Christ's earthly ministry, death and resurrection, and the coming of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. And that there are still three which have yet to find their consummation or their ultimate fulfillment. And the next one to be fulfilled is the Feast of Trumpets. And there's a place in the Bible that talks about a trumpet blast. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 to 18, the Apostle Paul says that the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall be raised. Feast of Trumpets points forward to this day of harvest of souls. And then what happens right after the Feast of Trumpets? It's the day of Yom Kippur. Do you know in Zechariah 12 to 14, it talks about how in the day of the Lord that there will be one third of the Jewish people who are left in the land and they shall look on the one whom they've pierced and mourn for him as for an only child. And on that day, a fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem for their cleansing. What is that? And Paul talks about it in Romans 11. If their rejection is meant that the Gentiles will be saved, what will their acceptance be but life from the dead? Life from the dead! That this is the point that Paul is making in Romans 11 is that there is a coming revival, a national revival of the people of Israel who will look on the one whom they've pierced and mourn for him and atonement will be made for them. And en masse, Paul says in Romans 11, 25 and 26, or I think 35 36, all Israel will be saved. All Israel, that's all Israel at that time. And then what comes after that? The Feast of Booths, where Israel would invite strangers to come in, to come into their own tents and be a family together. That's going to happen, you know. It talks about it. Zechariah talks about it. That in, in this time, that, look, I understand eschatology is not super easy to understand. But that in this day of the Lord, that all the nations will go up and celebrate the Feast of Booths together. And if they don't, then it won't rain on their land. Like, what does that mean? I don't even know. I don't know what it means, but it's going to happen, all right? It's going to happen. And so when it says here, all the people went away to eat and drink and send portions and celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which had been made known to them. I just have to think that the thing that they're celebrating is the hope of the resurrection. That's what it is. It's the hope of the resurrection. If, if you didn't have the hope of the resurrection, it would be really, really hard to celebrate the things that are said in the law. Because the law does not save us. The law only condemns us. So then what are they celebrating as they're listening to the condemnation of the law? They had to be celebrating the fact that there is a redeemer coming who redeems them from the curse of the law. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. And you know, they never would have known it if they didn't have preachers taking the word of God to the people. That is the most fundamental need of this society today. That's what it is. It needs that. Our society needs the preaching of the Bible, the faithful administration of the Bible, the, 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 the correctly dividing the word of truth, the 
This society needs that more than it needs money, more than it needs politics, more than it needs any kind of psychology, more than it needs philosophy. It needs this. This is the only hope for us. If we turn away from this, then America's already gone and dead. It already is, and under judgment. Leonard Ravenhill said, he wrote a book titled, America's Too Young to Die. I don't know that it is. If we continue down the path, if, if our country continues down the path that it's been going on, it will die. When we turn away from God, when a nation turns its back upon God, it cannot live because God is the author of life, both corporately and individually. He's the author uh, of, of nations. He's the one who puts kings and rulers in their places. He determines the times and the places set for all of us. He determines it all. That's why, more than anything else, my desire is that the churches will get back to preaching the gospel, preaching the Bible, as Luther saw it, as Calvin saw it, as Beza saw it. Get back to this. This is what's needed. This is what can affect change in the life and heart of any person. And it doesn't matter what they're like. It doesn't matter what kind of sin they may have committed in the past. There was a young man who was just talking to me out there, and you know what he said to me? He said, I've lived a really bad life. Just now. And I said to him, not so bad that Jesus Christ cannot forgive you. Not so bad that the blood of Jesus is insufficient for you. He asked for my phone number. This is what's needed. This is, this is the hope of the world. The gospel is the hope of the world. Jesus says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Pray, therefore, for the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. You know, sometimes we think the workers are plentiful and the harvest is few. But whenever we think something opposite of Jesus, Jesus is right and we're wrong. He's always right. Amen. The preacher thus says to the people, take comfort, rejoice, go joyfully, gladly. We especially, in some, in some way, is it, could it be some kind of conjecture to say that they understood fully that about Messiah? Honestly, I don't think so. I think that's the only explanation for their rejoicing. The joy of the Lord is their strength. Where do they get the joy from? From this promise that Jesus is coming. That's where we get our joy from. From the promise that Jesus is coming, that this wretched world that we live in is not going to be this way forever. It's not. It's going to end. The, the system of Satan and the devil is going to fall it's going to be destroyed, and Christ the King is going to reign and rule on this earth. Amen. He is. That's our great hope. And so we too can go out and rejoice, understanding the words which are being made known to us by the illumination of the Spirit. Let us pray. Thank God for His grace in giving us His word. <clears throat> Gives us everything we need for life and for godliness. Let's pray. Oh, our Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for these people that have gathered here this evening. I pray that we would not leave our Bibles on the shelf. That we would eat the words, Lord Jesus, you say to us that Man does not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. And so we cannot have only one meal every week. If we have one meal every week, Lord, we will be emaciated and die. But feed us with your word. Give us a desire, just like these people had a desire to hear from you through the Bible. Lord, we thank you so much for this beautiful account of that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I would like to...
sing uh, one song with you as we as we go. Um, which one is it? Eighty one. Um, we're going to sing. A mighty fortress is our God, and I, and I want to I want to draw your attention to one thing before Carol starts playing here. Um, You know, I, I was there in Wittenberg and I sang this song standing outside of the castle church and four, four or five years ago, and five years ago. And I want to draw your attention to the verse four. It says, that word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them abideth. You know, in other words, what, what Luther's saying there is, we don't thank the world for having this word. This is God's gift to us, not the world. The world wants the word to be destroyed. The world doesn't care about the Bible. The world wants to burn the Bible. This word above all earthly powers, no thanks to them, abideth. The spirit and the gifts are ours. Through him who with us sideth, let goods and kindred go. This mortal life also, the body they may kill. God's truth abideth still. His kingdom is forever. Hallelujah. Let's stand together and sing.
of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant, even Jesus our Lord, equip you in every good thing to do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. And all of God's people said, Amen. 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 May God be with you all. Thank you, brother.